So this is a patient. And this is going to be interactive, so you guys have to pay attention, because you have to come up with a diagnosis in class. You won't be doing it at home. Um, so patient comes in with shortness of breath. So Mr. M is a 62-year-old guy who comes to the emergency department because he's been having difficulty breathing. It's been getting progressively worse over the last week. Uh, but he has been kind of having breathing difficulties for a while, like a couple years. So he's now short of breath at rest, like experiencing chest pain even with like a little bit walking. He also has gained 15 pounds over the past 10 days. Despite taking all of his medications, his feet appear really swollen and painful. At baseline, he sleeps sitting up because when he sleeps laying down, he becomes increasingly short of breath and gasps for air and wakes up at night. So he sleeps sitting up now. If you had asked him, he'd say, oh, first I'll use one pillow, then two pillows, then three pillows, and I just sit up and sleep. With this limited information, what do you think might be the primary cause of Mr. M feeling short of breath? Let's, let's start it. Kind of a biased question, but. All right, answer number four, which is inability to hydropump both. Excellent, you guys were paying attention during lecture. Can anyone explain why he's short of breath? Huh? That's, that explains the chest pain, that he's having pain with walking means something is not right with his heart. Yes? There's nothing wrong with his lungs by default. So if he's breathing, his lungs are supposed to be okay. There's something that the heart is doing to his lungs that is causing this problem. Okay, those are all great answers. The way to understand this is you have the left side of your heart, right? And you have the left ventricle, and you have the aorta, and then you've got pulmonary, uh, is it the pulmonary vein, right? That comes into the left of you. Tired. So, what do you think happens when this heart can't but pump but blood efficiently? Hmm? It backs up into the lungs. That's what happens. Because if the end diastolic volume will go up, right? If the heart cannot pump it, because it's going to stay, eventually, this valve, the mitral valve, which causes blood to come in from the left atrium to the left ventricle will face more and more resistance because it just can't fill anymore. I mean, there's only so much blood that can fall into the left ventricle. So it fills up. When it fills up, the pulmonary circulation gets backed up and, and water, essentially water, starts leaking in from the capillaries from the pulmonary circulation because pulmonary capillaries can also hold only so much. The water has to go somewhere. So it goes into the lung sacs, the alveoli, which breathe, which we'll learn about in respiratory system, the anatomy. So the lungs fill up with water. That's what causes shortness of breath. That's what decreases oxygen saturation and causes shortness of breath. Questions? Pushes it down. So then frees up more of your space to breathe. Because when you're lying down, all the capillaries have the same gravity. So everything gets out into top lung, middle lung, and lower lung, because you're lying down, and your lungs are like this, flat. When you sit up, gravity pulls all the water down to the bases, and it collects near the diaphragm, and leaves the remaining lung free to breathe. Kind of cool, right? That's one of the screening questions we ask when patients are going to heart failure, is like, how many pillows do you use to need to sleep at night? And they'll tell you they increased it, because it's so much more comfortable sitting up, because the water doesn't fill the lungs anymore. Majority of it is empty. So, Past medical history, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol, two myocardial infarctions, high heart attacks in 2000. This is not a very strange story. I wrote this case from scratch. These are patients like many of them I've seen in clinic all the time. It's not very strange. Myocardial infarctions in 2011, blockage in LAD, which is left anterior descending artery from the left main. There's two main circulations in the heart, right coronary, left coronary. The left main has two branches, left circumflex, which is LCX, and left anterior descending, which is LAD. And then RC is the right side. And there's multiple branches and some collaterals that we talked about. So they got two heart attacks, one in blockage in LAD, and one blockage in RC and LCX. And because first one, they put a stent in, because it was just one, and other ones seemed OK. The next one, two years later, they found that both of them had a horrible stenosis, and the stent wouldn't really work well. So they did a cabbage, which we studied in lecture, just bypass with surgery, by open heart surgery. 
and then he had mild chronic kidney disease. Someone asked in the renal lecture why someone with heart failure might develop chronic kidney disease. Any answers? You guys think about it. It's a question for homework, but someone asked it, and I think we said the answer last time, but just think about it. It's, it's not that hard to get why he would have kidney disease because of heart failure in this case. Obesity, because he has BMI of over 30. Smoked before, quit in 2011 after his first heart attack. No uh, alcohol after that, no recreational drug use. He's taking these medications. One of your assignments is to understand what these do in heart failure, so we won't go over this right now. So this is his physical exam. He feels breathless. His blood pressure is really low, 85 or 51. That's kind of concerning. His heart rate's high, it's 104. That's a little concerning, because it already can't pump very much. Now you're trying to pump it even faster. I don't know what would happen to his filling state. It would just poor, poor things for this guy to have this blood pressure and heart rate. Respirations are 24. Each of us is breathing like 10 to 12 mi per minute, maybe 14. 24 is kind of high. It's like, like fast, like every two seconds or so. Uh, he says, I can't breathe, I don't want to die, he's obese, he's in acute distress, his neck veins are distended, they're pumping up with blood. Now you can think of the backup logic from the right heart, because if the whole heart isn't working, because he had infarctions in his right circulation and left circulation. So we've been always talking about left ventricle when we do all this calculation, right? We can do the same for right ventricles. We can have a right ventricle PV loop, right ventricle and diastolic volume, similar stuff. So then the blood will pool up into the um, right side, which would be the venous system, so jugular veins here. And then he's got rouse over his lower bases in the lungs, which basically are the sound you hear when there's water in the lungs. Cough, productive of frothy sputum, which means the water is coming up as cough. S3 gallop basically means when the heart fills in with blood and diastole. In normal people, you don't hear an extra sound. You hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, and everything's happy. When the heart's dilated and there's too much blood in there, think about taking an empty pot of water and throwing in a glass full more on there. It'll create that sound. That's what the gallop is. So when the heart's dilated and it's like filled up already, then on top of that, you throw in some more in diastole. It's just going to create this whooshing sound, which creates the S3, which is a third abnormal sound, because two are normal, third is abnormal. And then liver is palpable lower, again, back up of the venous circulation from the portal veins and the inferior vena cava. So all that stuff, four plus spitting edema, which means he has fluid in his legs all the way up here. So clearly his heart's in terrible shape. He's like retaining water everywhere, on the left circulation, right circulation, everywhere. So he feels he's going to die. Chest labs note that his creatinine, which is the indication of kidney function, rose from 1.4 to 2.1 on admission. 1.4 was already high. One is about normal. 1.4 was his chronic kidney disease, probably from his heart condition. You guys will figure out why. And now it's getting worse in this admission. His anemia, which is fine, low grade anemia. And then his liver enzymes are rising a little bit. He's got no hepatitis or nothing. So why are his liver enzymes rising? So his kidney function is falling. His liver function is falling. His heart's already failing, as we established. We look at his EKG and it shows evidence of old MIs, which we talked about, but no new MI. So his chest pain is not from like an actual blockage right now. And then his chest x-ray is, this is normal, that's his patient. You can see all the whiteness, that's all the fluid. That's how our chest x will look, hopefully. And that's how they, this guy's look because his lungs have got a lot of water in them. This is his coronary cath from 2013, which shows the blockage and stenosis in RCA and shows the stenosis in LCX. This is probably stentable. I made the patient unstentable and gave him a cabbage, so you guys know that cabbage can be done. This is not his picture, obviously. This is a sample picture from online. But that's kind of what a coronary cath looks like with the dye. You take extra film, then you can see the vasculature. This is what a normal beating heart looks like. You see it's pumping really well, right? Valves are moving, opening, closing, blood flowing. It's pretty nice. This one is this patient's heart. Is it pumping anything at all? It's barely contracting. And it's very dilated and ballooned up. Like, you can't even tell that the muscle is actually coming in. It's like pretty bad. So what is the patient's diagnosis? I already said the diagnosis several times in the presentation. Heart failure, likely from multiple infarctions in the past, because each infarction kind of takes away some of your function. Because every time you have a heart attack, we talked about ischemia, we talk about tissue not getting enough blood not getting enough perfusion. If you're lucky, you get the stent placed in quick enough that the perfusion restores, heart's fine. But that may not be the case. And everyone reacts differently. So this guy had all three main vessels damaged at some point or the other, which means a large portion of his right and left heart was ischemic for some time and suffered. And that's why he has heart failure, which has worsened over the last three years, right? So our questions are, so he has a heart failure exacerbation. That's what you would call it. You would say the patient is admitted with a congestive heart failure exacerbation to the hospital. 
So he gets, ad and we find out that he has been in the hospital back and forth over the past year, and each time his heart function has worsened. His ejection fraction on the echo, which we, do which we did, was 21%, which was down from 30% two months ago. Ejection fraction in us would be somewhere between 55 and 60%, 50, 50 to 60%, 55 plus in all of us, 55 to 65. That's a significant drop, right? 20% is like, Nothing compared to 55, 60%. And you guys should know how to compute the formula for ejection fraction. It's kind of fun to work out. It's very simple based on stroke volume and end diastolic volume. And so patients with end stage heart failure fall into two categories. You can read about those. Our patient is probably has advanced structural heart disease. He's pretty sick. We made him pretty sick in the case. We wrote the case, so we made him really sick, right? He's end stage heart failure. And um, he's getting symptoms at rest despite all the medications he was on which you'll have to study what they're for. And the one-year mortality, which means the death within one year of advanced heart failure is pretty high, 50% mortality. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through taking care of Mr. M by answering the following questions. One is you're gonna look at his medications. I broke them down into five sets. You're gonna interpret for me what each of the set of medications is for. Some of them are really easy and everything should be Googleable, but I think I want you guys to talk about it and understand why those medications, especially the ones in set two and three. For one, four, and five, you can just say what the meds are for and forget about it. For two and three, a little bit more explanation on why they're helpful in heart failure, like what is their mechanism of action and why it helps. Second part, we talked about the creatinine rising to 2.1 from 1.3. So to extend the renal, because we don't have a separate renal case, I'm incorporating a little renal in here. Why do you think this value increased? Why did kidney function get poorer over time in the, in the past two or three months? And his liver enzymes are starting to rise as well. So what can you say about his circulatory state for his systemic circulation during this time? Third question, the patient is admitted to the CCU, which is the coronary care unit. What are some of the things you can do to support this patient in the hospital until a more definitive treatment plan is created, right? Specifically, answer two questions. What can you, help him, what can you do to help him breathe better slash remove fluid from his lungs? There could be two or three ways of doing this that I can think of. And support his cardiac function. His contractility is like so poor, it's not contracting. Can you do anything to make his heart beat faster pharmacologically? Or not faster, better. Not faster, better. Um, and think of which variables, preload, afterload, and contractility is a problem. I kind of give you the answers to all of this, but you'll have to think about it. Assume that any reversible causes have been fixed. That means his bypasses are working fine. It's just his heart muscle is not good anymore. And the patient is in CCU for days, needs a lot of hemodynamic support to keep his body going. Identify some non-pharmacologic, that means non-drug-based interventions, the first three talk about drug-based interventions, for someone in end-stage heart failure and specify how they work from an engineering standpoint. And we will build on this list next time to talk about what